Good day, St. James. It's good to be with you all today on the fourth Sunday of Advent. We're less than a week away from Christmas. I hope you enjoyed the uh, the winter weather we had, and it didn't cause too many major uh, inconveniences, uh, but allowed you to uh, just uh, behold that beautiful winter landscape and maybe uh, help to get you a little bit more into the Christmas spirit that's been a little elusive this year. Uh, a couple things that have helped me uh, get into the spirit uh, have been your generosity uh, the, between the angel tree and, and, and other gifts that I've been able to uh, to share with those uh, with particular needs in the community have been incredibly welcome and uh, and 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 sustaining uh, also uh, I've loved to see all the pictures of those gingerbread houses so many uh, folks uh, sent in a picture and um, and Jen thank you for organizing that it was so uh, amazing to see how creative um, uh, people were able to get even one of uh, of, of the school with the uh, replete with, with with the dogs um, was great to see so thank you all very very much uh, and as we move closer to Christmas, uh, a difficult announcement uh, is that we will not be able to have in-person worship on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day. We had uh, planned to have services in the parking lot, um, but following the uh, uh, encouragement of the diocese and the governor uh, and discerning uh, what we'd be able to do and how we'd be able to do it, um, we've determined that, that this Christmas, uh, much like Easter, uh, we will... Uh, we will come into your households. We'll come in virtually, and, uh, uh, and we pray that uh, that we're able to bring some some Christmas joy into uh, and context into your house. Uh, uh, one of the things that uh, this may enable us to do uh, is to uh, to go to Christmas's past and uh, and pull some of those beautiful. Uh, beautiful uh, moments where we've been able to sing collectively and uh, and share share our joy and um, and the richness of Christmas together and people have said uh, again and again how much they miss the music especially at Christmas and, and so hopefully uh, in your household with um, the, the the full choir and and the full congregation singing uh, hymns from uh, Christmas's past uh, we might uh, increase in joy and, and and wonder at the moment that we're celebrating and so uh, so we'll send you details uh, uh, but we will definitely uh, push uh, previous Christmas services and uh, and, and musical offerings uh, up to the top uh, of our uh, uh, catalog and, and also put together uh, Christmas services that are both new uh, and, re and uh, reflective of years past. So, um, so with that, I hope you do uh, enjoy a beautiful and wonderful um, and, and grace-filled Christmas. Also, as we get to the very end of our year, uh, I just want to encourage folks to make your um, your commitment to 2021 so that we can begin the year uh, able to, to put together a budget and uh, and live into that and to um, to make your commitments, uh, fulfill your, your commitments to, to this year, both in terms of our uh, operating and um, in terms of our uh, connected campaign for those still paying on that uh, on that commitment. So uh, the church is, is, is greatly indebted to all of you for your generosity. Thank you very, very much. Uh, and now we'll begin our worship. We have lit three candles for hope, for peace, and for joy. Today we light the fourth candle, the candle of love. With this flame, we signify the love of God that surrounds and fills us at all times but that we recognize in a special way in the Christmas story. There is no greater power than love. It is stronger than rulers and empires, stronger than grief or despair, stronger than even death. We love because he loves us.
Loving God, we open ourselves to you this Christmas season. As these candles are lit, light our lives with your imagination. Show us the creative power of hope. Teach us the peace that comes from justice. Fill us with the kind of joy that cannot be contained, but must be shared. Magnify your love within us. Prepare our hearts to be transformed by you, that we may walk in the light of Christ. Amen. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Merry Christmas, St. James. Sorry we're not doing this in person. We look forward to seeing everybody in 2021. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Purify our conscience, Almighty God, by your daily visitation, that your Son, Jesus Christ, at his coming, may find in us a mansion prepared for himself, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Prayers of the People, Form 2. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the Church, especially for Michael, our presiding bishop, Susan, Jennifer, and Porter, our bishops, Ben, and Ted, our clergy. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people, especially for Donald, our president, Joseph, our president-elect, the Congress, and the Supreme Court of the United States. We pray also for those in law enforcement, for their safety, their morale, and that they may know the support and gratitude of the communities they serve. We pray for those in the armed forces, their families, and all deployed in harm's way, especially for Mark. I ask your prayers for all those who have suffered or feared discrimination, mistreatment, or violence because of their God-given identity. Help us to understand, to acknowledge our corporate responsibility, and guide us towards sustained healing reconciliation, and unity. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, the lonely, the burdened, the anxious, and those in prison, especially during this season. Pray for those in any need or trouble, especially Cassia, Tom, Pat, Patty, Nalia, Howard, Marilee, Karen, Helen, Carol, Bonnie, Steve, Judy, John, Joan, Ansel, Tina, Linda, Fred, Kay, Ed, Marie, and for those whom we now name either silently or aloud. I ask your prayers for all health care and emergency workers, those who continue to put themselves at an increased risk to provide essential services, and those facing economic insecurity as a result of COVID-19. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of God. Pray that they may find and be found by God. I ask your prayers for St. James Episcopal Church and School, our Stephen ministers and their care partners. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died and any whom we now name either silently or aloud. I ask your prayers for the peace and unity of the Church of God, for the faithful and growing relationship between First Baptist Church and St. James Episcopal Church. We give thanks for our many blessings, which we now name either silently or aloud.
Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have the grace to glorify Christ in our own day. From wherever we find ourselves, we offer our prayers to you, the God who promises to abide with us. During this time, may we know and trust your presence in our lives. Continue to bind us together. Embolden us as your church to be signs and agents of your hope, your healing, and your love. We pray this in the name of your Son, who came and dwelt among us, Jesus our Lord. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of Luke. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for what you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in the womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of the ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob, Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. And now you, now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, also has conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who is said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord, let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The word of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. With a handful of folks, I've been reading this book, My Grandmother's Hands, by Resma Menachem, and he is a therapist talking about um, the trauma associated with, um, with our history of race uh, and just all of the trauma uh, that... Uh, that exists within us and how we deal with it and how we process it uh, and how we move on to, to, to something richer. And uh, a few pages struck me both, uh, both individually and as I responded to a story we sometimes anesthetize, that beautiful and familiar story uh, captured in so many a Christmas pageant of Mary uh, being visited and making her yes. But there is a lot behind that yes. Uh, and it struck me as I uh, reflected on clean and dirty pain, which I'll talk a little bit about, uh, how much uh, Mary's yes had to process through uh, the risks um, and the pains associated with her decision. So let me read. Every therapist will tell you healing involves discomfort. So does refusing to heal. And over time, refusing to heal is always more painful. In my therapy office, I tell clients there are two kinds of pain, clean pain and dirty pain. Clean pain is pain that mends and can build your capacity for growth. And the pain you experience when you know exactly what you need to say or do, when you really, really don't want to say or do it, and when you do it anyway. It's also the pain you experience when you have no idea what to do. When you're scared or worried about what might happen. And when you step forward into that unknown anyway, with honesty and with vulnerability. Experiencing clean pain enables us to engage our integrity and to tap into our body's inherent resilience and coherence in a way that dirty pain does not. Paradoxically, only by walking into our pain or discomfort, experiencing it, moving through it and metabolizing it, can we grow. It's how the human body works. 
clean pain hurts like hell. But he does go on to say, eventually the body can then settle and more room for growth is created in its nervous system and the self becomes freer and more capable because it now has access to energy that was previously protected, bound and constricted. When this happens, people's lives often improve in other ways as well. All of this can happen both personally and collectively. And this is what he has to say about dirty pain. Dirty pain is the pain of avoidance, of blame and denial People respond from their most wounded parts, become cruel or violent or physically or emotionally run away. They experience dirty pain. They also create more of it for themselves and for others. It goes on to say, instead, indeed, usually out of fear, people choose dirty pain, the pain of silence and the pain of avoidance. And invariably, in doing so, it prolongs their pain, individually and collectively. So let's go back to that image, that beautiful image of that angel coming to Mary and saying, Fear not, do not be afraid. I come with great news. You have been chosen, Mary, favored one. going to bear a child that will change the world, a child in whom so much has been pinned. All the hopes of so many will be realized in this child, this Christ child, this son of God, this son of man, this son of Mary. Mary, a teenager, has a decision to make. And from the lens of a couple thousand years removed, maybe the lens of our comfort, it seems like an easy yes. What a privilege. We also know how the story ends. We also know the place that Mary holds in our hearts and in the church's collective hearts and has for so long. But let's go back to that fragile, vulnerable teenage girl. And I say fragile and vulnerable, not because of her own being, but because of the society in which she finds herself. Mary begins with skepticism, not necessarily skepticism about the capacity of God to put this child in her belly, but probably the overwhelming skepticism of the whole situation. Can this happen? What will my husband-to-be say? What will society say? What will my family say? How will this end? Just think. Mary's yes means that she has put a mark on her head. That Joseph, however benevolent he is, has the legal right to kill her. He has violated, she has violated their agreement. She has brought stain upon their family. She has borne a child that is not his. Mary's family has the right to do likewise. She's embarrassed and brought shame to them in a shame culture. If they are benevolent enough to let her come back home she still has no means of taking care of herself, taking care of her family. They were counting on Mary's husband to help in that regard. Maybe there's a life of prostitution. It's a lot to entrust to God. That's a lot riding on that yes. And as I've thought about Mary's yes, I've thought about the lens that I get to see the story beyond just whether this child will make it to that birthday, to that Christmas day, and the risk to Mary on that Christmas day, will she survive childbirth? 
or well beyond that. Will this child ever feel like Mary's child? Will this child always be the son of God first, the son of man second, and Mary's third? Did she realize that, that difficult time where she loses him in the temple and spends days looking for him? only to hear, where did you think I would be but in my father's house? Did she think about that when he was drawing unwanted attention to himself and his family in his hometown and being rejected, and the family was trying, trying to quiet him so no more shame could be brought upon that family? Son of God first, son of man second, Mary's beloved child third. And in that yes, she's also saying yes to the clean pain of holding that lifeless son who died on the cross. Showing up at the tomb to wrap her grief as she wrapped Jesus in spices and cloths for burial. This yes is so full of clean pain, it would be so much easier to say no. So much easier to take that dirty pain of not realizing God's dream or of the dream of so many others, of just saying the world is broken, but it's doable. I can get through it. With my head down, nose to the grindstone. Don't look up. She had to choose clean pain that was going to hurt like hell. Or that dirty pain that would weigh her down, not just for her lifetime, but for so many more. And she says, after questioning, after a moment of processing, of saying the easy no, against the difficult yes. She says, here I am. Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be. Let it be in me. Let it be. She says yes to the difficult but clean pain of realizing and participating in God's dream for the world. As we prepare for Advent, or as we are almost through Advent, as we prepare for that light that will come into the world, for that Christ child to be born, for that dream to be realized, what part of us fails to say yes to God's dream, to choose clean pain over that dirty pain that continues to mire us and weigh us down? in our relationships, in our vocations, in our individual hearts, and in our collective souls? Where are we choosing that long-suffering no instead of that acute pain of saying yes to God, of participating in God's dream? Another book that I'm reading right now, Bishop Curry's new book, has him describing, as he did in that sermon at the royal wedding, what it is to participate in God's love, to live into that agape dream of God, to spend our lives closer to the center of that, to live agape in the wholeness of life. And people have come up to him, CEOs of companies, says, he's great, you're a bishop, but how do I, as a CEO of a company, in my private life, my professional life, live into agape. And he says the same thing. It's not going to be easy and it's going to have some consequences. But choosing that clean pain of binding as much of our lives as we can into the love and the dream of God is what eventually liberates our soul 
and provides for that richness and happiness and that clear place where something new can begin, where God can be born. So as you prepare for Christmas, as you reflect on your own heart, where can we rid ourselves of some of that dirty pain so that we are open for that great and unknown and scary adventure where we can say, as Mary did, here I am. Let it be. Let it be. Amen. May the sun of righteousness shine upon you, scatter the darkness from before your path, and the blessing of God Almighty, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Our worship is now ended, and our service in the world begins. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God.